Ebers, potentially pretentious ingredient number one is under that cloche. May I? You may. It is part of a plant, leafy, that has been dried, possibly toasted. This has kind of got fruity, chocolatey tea notes. This is why I like having a chef in this position. Definitely. Well, Ebers, I can tell you that this is Chinese Da Hong Pao Oolong Tea. So we've bought it from the Rare Tea Company, and in their words, this is perhaps the finest oolong in China, grown from a unique and ancient loose leaf tea cultivated in the Waiyashan UNESCO World Heritage Site. Da Hong Pao means big red robe, and the tea, wait for this, the tea is steeped in legend. <laughs> Clever copywriting. Clever copywriting. Culturally, tea doesn't originate from the UK, and yet I think it is now so ingrained in our British culture, a cup of tea puts everything to rest, because it's the conversation that goes along with the tea. And therefore, it's so important and so everyday that it can't be pretentious. Except, <laughs> as we have proven time and time and time again, there are specific artisanal specialist in short supply and high demand examples that drive a price up and potentially make it pretentious. They only produce a few kilos of it every single year and you have to go to the heritage site to buy it. Did you? No, we, we, we sourced it from the Rare Tea Company who did that for us. Excellent. Quite an admin heavy job that. <laughs> Right, Ebers, here's the plan. We need between two and four grams of the tea. That sounds like three to me. Three sounds good. <laughs> uh, for 150 millilitres of water to make our actual tea. Mm -hmm. However, first of all, we're going to use an inch of hot water at 100 degrees to rapidly wash the leaf for a few seconds. We'll then discard that water. And what that's going to do is essentially open up the rolled leaves and start to soften it. 150 millilitres, no need to reboil the kettle. Basically, each time that you use that leaf, it gets softer, and so therefore it requires a lower temperature of water in order to make the tea. Wow. You can use the same leaves all day, just keep topping it back up with hot water, and you'll be able to taste subtle differences within each infusion. Now we know what's going on, I'm gonna do it all again, but with our less pretentious oolong tea. Oh, yeah. Have you already made a decision on this? No, I just know the name of the format. <laughs> First infusion of the inverted commas lesser tea. We'll call it our control tea. Given that we were fairly precise in our weights and measures and temperatures and times, the two products, the two end results, look very similar. Here we go. Drinkable. I was surprised that it tastes of what it smells like. And I know that sounds silly, but often you'll get it on the nose, like fruit teas that smell really fruity, and then you make a drink and you go, where's the flavour It just tastes Whereas like Whereas actually, yeah. I'm still getting, whilst subtle and delicate, dark, sour, cherry, chocolate notes. Ooh. In the Rare Tea Company's tasting notes for De Hong Pao, they say that it's darker in colour and deeper in flavour than their other oolongs, with notes of nutty chocolate and a rounded, earthy yet sweet aroma. Definitely uh, chocolatey, there's no sugar in it, it's not sweet, but it is kind of fruity, which we might associate with that. Whereas the more regular one, our control, I would say is more citrus floral. But they are worlds apart, they really are. So shall we talk about price? Yes. How much is this regular oolong? That regular oolong, loose leaf, 25 grams, £2.50. £40? That seems like a lot for a bag of tea. £12.49. Pence. Oh, oh I've, been done a, I've been done a blinder. Which actually works out to 33 pence per cup yes. if you use two grams of tea per 150 millilitres of water and three infusions. It's still a lot more than, you know, the tea bags that we buy on a daily basis. It's a very different product, but actually, that changes the game entirely. Pretentious or not? Not. You need a lot of arguably pretentious apparatus to make it work <laughs> with like grammage of scales and infusion and stuff like that. But as a product, it's not pretentious, it's just rare. Off to a happy start. Ebers, 
Lift the cloche on number two. Ah, oh, tequila cask matured, aged six years in a very beautiful gift box. Ooh, oh, <sighs> oh, I've seen a word I wasn't expecting. <laughs> Experience chocolate. Let me stop you there because you are only on step one of the opening. <laughs> so the experience continues. Ecuadorian dark chocolate. We've still got something about tequila. We know that it is 73% cacao. And as you lift it out of the experience, you get given a cocoa pod. It's a lovely presentation box. There we go. Oh, it's another hint. No, that one's not a hinge. Oh. I have just clocked what this is. Oh yeah? Is this the world's most expensive chocolate from Ecuador? We can't lay claim to whether it is, it is the world's most expensive. It is expensive. Ecuadorian dark chocolate aged in Don Julio tequila cups. Ebers, you're doing my this is. Ebers, <laughs> this is. <laughs> Toak tequila cast aged origin dark chocolate. So this is their words. This chocolate celebrates a marriage between two of Latin America's finest delicacies, chocolate and tequila. The company Toac used their chocolate, the Rain Harvest 2015, to mature in Don Julio Gonzalez, founder of one of the most exquisite pure tequilas in the world, casks to impart the cocoa with delicate notes of caramel, butterscotch, for a creamy result with a sweet agave tang. Oh, it's still going. <laughs> <laughs> now that more packaging, the setting is important. Choose a place that is free from strong odours. And also both the room and chocolate should be at room temperature. We're good on both of those. When it's time to begin, bring your attention and focus to the chocolate. So, Let's have a look at that chocolate. Oh, it's even got a little lean in the middle. So Toac was born from a rainforest conservation project. Started in Ecuador in 2007. They work hand in hand with small cacao growers and pay them the highest price per pound in all of Ecuador. Using all of my senses, visual first, there's some blooming on it. Oh no! Which suggests it hasn't had the most perfect temperature control between here and Ecuador. While still perfectly edible, that might have an effect on the nuances. Number two, audible. Snap. Toac, get their tempering chocolate badge. Not lemony, but like a fragrant citrus. It's not its not like chocolate orange, but it's got that kind of citrus floral. I'd be gutted if it was like a Terry's chocolate orange. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Here we go. Let it melt. Move the chocolate into your mouth, don't chew. Rather, as it melts, move it around inside your mouth, as you would a mouthful of wine, to maximise exposure to your taste buds. It is very, very smooth. I am getting the Tequila tang. You are. Super subtle, but so very delicious. So good. Oh. Oh. This is definitely one of the best chocolates I've had up there in like top handful. But I do think that's probably the learning, the experience, the education that came with it and the presentation. The chocolate itself then delivers on all those things. It's a shame it bloomed. So for that 50 gram bar, what do you think the price comes in at? That's ridiculous. Come on, that's what we want. I think this be might ridiculous. be... I said it on the tee, I think this might be a £40 bar of chocolate and it's only 50 grams. That's insane. Ebers, this is £165. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that, I am absolutely speechless. Um, but I get it. It's just not necessarily where our heads are at with the perception of chocolate, which has become such a commodity in our lives. I guess the only remaining question to ask is, Toac, tequila aged dark chocolate, pretentious or not? I mean, it's got wooden tongs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this moves into the pretentious line, but I wholly respect it for it. It's love pretentious that. and I'm here for it. And I love it. <laughs> wow. Hello, Barry here. This is Sorted's very own strawberry gin liqueur with black pepper and vanilla. It's sweet, easy to drink, and it's made with surplus strawberries. So it's super sustainable and it's good for the planet. I drink mine with English sparkling wine 
manuka honey and a dash of collagen powder. Mmm, lovely. And that there is why it's in this video. Halfway through, 50-50 split. Normally these get more and more expensive, so I'm, I'm worried and excited in equal measure. Lift das Kloche. Danke. I know what these are. It is corn. Wow. Mmm. Mm. You make popcorn without taking off the cob. So Ebers, this is Zara Mama's Popper Cob Gourmet Popping Corn. We've got you two different varieties there. We've got Midnight Blue and Rich Ruby Red. 100% no colorings, no artificial flavorings. That is how they grow. That is the style of corn, the variety. This is actually suggested by Sorted's own Barry Taylor. So if he's identifying it as a pretentious ingredient, then we know it's got mileage. In terms of making the popcorn, you want to place the cob lengthways in the bag and tie it with the provided tie. And then you're going to want to pop it in a 800 watt microwave for one and a half to two minutes until the popping slows down to once every two to three seconds. This is a uh, Raf. It's got good biceps, hasn't he? Great, great arms. Okay, we're getting some steam inside the bag. There we go. Oh, it. I didn't need this commentary. <laughs> I've got to be honest, Evers. We popity pop 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 pop. It's working. Oh, oh. Oh, it's very white. It didn't stay purple. This is blowing my mind. That is cool. Seeing as you're a chef, we thought we'd provide you with some interesting options there, should you want them. It's tasty popcorn. We've put melted butter, sea salt, and a little pinch of garlic granules. Lovely. And we put the cob back in and got probably the same again. And there's still some that haven't popped. Oh, it is tasty, isn't it? No, it's very good crunchy popcorn. Red rather than blue, same, same otherwise. The Zara Mama's popcorn is available in 11 different colours and varieties. And each different colour has its own texture and natural taste. That's the first one. Midnight blue. Tastes like corn. <laughs> oh! Oh! Yep, completely different. Oh, I love that, because you went into that thinking you were wrong. Yeah, you he, were right. he thought this was a waste of time. I've yeah. already popped some corn, what do I need to pop some more corn? Midnight blue, less bitter mm. and more buttery, naturally buttery. Whereas the rich ruby red is much drier and has almost a grassy hay-likeness to it. I imagine there's a huge markup on this and well done to them, because as an experience, as a learning, as a tasting experience, it's really good. Well, hit him. Let's go for price, Evers. £4.50 a pop. A pop? A pop? It's almost as expensive as the chocolate. <laughs> so I can tell you, Ebbers, for the Midnight Blue, we paid £7.30. And for the Rich Ruby Red, we paid £7.04. pence. I think it's genius, and I think it's great marketing, and I think it's very clever, and it's something that I would share and tell people about, and I think a lot of people should try it. Hit him with the question right in the face. Right. Is it pretentious? No, it's insightful. On to the final one. Final one, Ebers, give the cloche a lift on number four. Ugh! <laughs> what on earth is that? Such a good lineup today. It's really good. Barnacles. He's a chef. It's like, I always think of barnacles as being like uh, mussels cling to rocks, razor clams, similar family, but bury themselves, and you've got that hard shell. You've got the hard shell at the end, but this bit is odd. Ebers, these are gooseneck barnacles. It does look like a gooseneck. The gooseneck or good barnacle is an expensive rarity chipped off rocky shorelines. It's very dangerous to collect them, which adds to the price. An average of five people each year die trying to get them. You can only harvest them at low tide, obviously, when the rocks are accessible, which only give them a few hours a day to harvest. The fact that they have literally chipped off part of the rock, i.e. you get the rock with it, so it's not like you're... That's free. <laughs> Can have a bit of rock. Well, I imagine they've also sold it to you by weight, so be careful. <laughs> yep. It looks like almost an artificial bit of material or clothing. I've never seen anything like them. The goose neck, yeah, they look like the neck of a goose. Would you like to eat some cooked and prepared goose neck barnacles? Yes, please. They don't look a lot better. Oh, that is so disrespectful. They smell a lot better. They've been cooked in a white wine garlic uh, and parsley sauce. 
Oh, I can smell them from here, they smell delicious. You can pinch them at the bottom. You can squeeze a little bit above there and then it pops out the top and you can pull them. There you go. Or you can actually peel that rubbery shell. Give it a lick, maybe a bite. Tell us how it tastes. As you'd expect, super delicious because it's garlic, butter and herbs. The texture is on par with a well-cooked snail or, which my association is the garlic butter, or a badly cooked mussel or clam. I can't work out where the <laughs> positive is there, but I, I know what you mean. Also known in Spanish as pesebes. I think I've seen even Jose Pizarro mm. talk about them on a Saturday morning television show of some sort. In a kitchen. <laughs> or for brunch. One of the two. There is a lot of admin, but good seafood needs it. They obviously have to cling to sea, so it is either North Spain, Portuguese coast, or south of France, because you've gone full Mediterranean with the garlic and herbs. These are from Spain. What's interesting is once they gather 7.5% of the harvest, they then leave the rock for six months to prevent over-harvesting. That's really important. So you basically, uh, in order to prepare these, uh, you can toss them in boiling water for a couple of minutes, to whip them out, peel them, eat them. So nice and easy. I guess why we're talking pretentious here mm. is they are very rare. They are very expensive. And considering how dangerous they are, are they necessary? Do we need them? Great question. And there's lots of other ingredients that probably fall into that bracket of being traditional. And you should protect that tradition. As long as they're not doing it because somebody is holding a gun to their head and saying, go and risk your life for this. We need to clarify that we actually had a 250 gram bag of frozen gooseneck barnacles. Okay. Weren't able to source them fresh um, because we're not on the coast of Spain. However, how much do you think we paid for that 250 gram bag? You certainly don't get a huge amount of edible produce off of it, but there's also lots of other ingredients where that is exactly the same. 20 pounds? But you're pretty bang on, £20.90 is the exact price that we paid, so pricey. Yeah, very pricey for the amount you actually get, but again, like so many of what we've done today, kind of a cool experience. I'm glad I've tried them. I wouldn't go out of my way to get them again. What's been interesting about the lineup today is that, firstly, what a privileged position we are in to be able to try these types of things, because I think as individuals, we would not be affording or able to get them and try them on our own. Secondly, gooseneck barnacles, Evers, are they pretentious or not? I'd say they're the least pretentious today, but they are super traditional and steeped in history, and by the sounds of it, carefully protected. Not, not pretentious. Well, you've heard Ebers, the chef's perspective, but what do you think? Comment below, numbers one to four, pretentious or not. And let us know in the comments what other potentially pretentious ingredients should we be testing next? You know what's missing? A little fino sherry. Ah, oh, I thought you meant another thank you for giving you such a wonderful experience. I've enjoyed today a lot. I've spent a lot of money, that's why. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>